it's old water. It'll be fun. Welcome to the Grappling With Podcast. Dr. Delicious. Chris Hardy and William Walker will take a deep dive into topics covering wellness and prevention, performance, recovery, and injury management. Our mission is to provide the latest science-based <laughs> information cup, to help you get the most out of your grappling journey, both on, on sure, and man. off the mats, and help you good. overcome any challenges you may be grappling with. Dr. Hardy is a licensed physician and BJJ practitioner, but the contents of the podcast are meant for educational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. Please seek out personalized care from your own medical provider prior to implementing any medical treatment or intervention. Bill is a licensed buffoon. Mm. He says <laughs> things that are a little squirrely. Mm. Do not hold these things against his gym mates, his mm. family, Chris Hardy, Harry Hardy, or anybody at his gym. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> We're back. Yes, yes. We got a lot on the table today. Yeah, it sounds like it. A lot of things. That we're going to be chatting about. Awesome, man. But what do you got on the docket first? So we had some questions, and I just wanted to touch on them real quick. Not a full episode on some of these things, but okay. they are kind of more health wellness related. Okay. But one of them, I think a lot of jujitsu people will get um, some information out of because we deal with these issues a lot. And that's, you'll probably say it more technically, but our forearms. Mm-hmm. They will get massive amounts of soreness. Mm -hmm. Um, You've showed me some pin and stretch uh, kind of techniques techniques to Mm -hmm. to alleviate pain. Sometimes I'll get tingling in my fingers just from all all of this in here. So, and we have some people at the gym that are dealing with this actually Mm -hmm. right now, whether Mm -hmm. it be a tennis elbow kind of deal. Um, or what's the other? They call it golfer's elbow. Golfer's they're they're elbow. terrible names. So I'll, yeah. I'll go into it a little more. So I just want to touch briefly. Now, if you are interested and you do have some forearm tightness or pain in some of those areas, check out the video podcast because we'll show you a little bit of the pin and stretch yeah. kind of manipulation. Yeah, it's hard to describe over the audio, unfortunately. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, what's happening is... People will have maybe some grip fatigue Mm -hmm. immediately, just as we're sitting here, maybe some tingling. And often, especially with grapplers and non-grapplers even, Mm -hmm. it'll be something in this forearm region here. Yeah, up by the elbow, a lot of people um, talk about it. So, you know, looking at the good way to start is kind of figuring out what's going on first. If you look at the anatomy, kind of the forearm around the elbow... Mm-hmm. And if you, if right now Bill is, has his um, left arm flat palm, with palm his palm up. up. Mm-hmm. So if you look at what we call the radial side, in other words, the thumb side of the forearm, if you trace that all the way up to the elbow, to the side of the elbow, there's something called the lateral epicondyle. It's this little bony prominence on the outside here. Okay, yeah. On the, yeah, it's on the side, not th- the back where people think the actual bone where you strike people with. Mm-hmm. But to the, the lateral aspect of it is where all the muscles that make the wrist extend. And so if you can, so in other words, if, if you make a fist and then you bring your wrist into what's called extension. In other words, your knuckles are coming up. Like a reverse throttle. Every, yeah, or, like, or you're throttle th- like you're yeah. throttling something. All the muscles that make the wrist do that connect to that one little point there okay, on yeah, your you elbow. You can feel it flexing. There. Yeah, you can feel If you put your, put your fingers on that little prominence on the lateral elbow, on that epicondyle, you can feel it. And over time, it's also called tennis elbow. It's just repetitive gripping it, to that where you exceed the ability of those little tendons to keep up with the um, re- the metabolic requirements of that. In other words, yeah. so you'll start to have inflammation as the nervous system will kind of contract the muscle to try to protect, and then you mm. get decreased blood flow, and it gets this vicious cycle going. And it can be really nasty if you don't deal with it early. It can last for months. You know, and I know a guy, uh, actually a newly um, crowned professor, mm-hmm. Professor Boots, as oh, yeah. call him. He actually has this issue quite a bit. Like yeah. He doesn't have it on the inside. He has it on this radial side. Yeah. And it, it's because it came from, he runs a lot. Yep. He's actually probably listening to this while he's doing his morning run. Mm-hmm. And it's because when he runs, he has that motion with his wrist. So he runs like a weirdo? Uh, I mean, that's not how I would describe it. But he, on both wrists. I'm joking. He yeah. kind of runs like So he this. has his wrist in extension. Yeah, he has. He doesn't make a fist with his hand. His his fingers are out, 
and he yeah. just kind of so shakes his think shoulders. about what's happening there. If his wrist is in extension when he's doing that, you're holding that muscle under a con- low level contraction, mm. okay? And then you're swinging and you're trying to, if you maintain that wrist extension position, it's almost like trying to do a negative. Again, you're, you're holding that wrist there. It puts Got stress it. on that. Every time you swing your arm, instead of the wrist flopping down, he's holding it up. Mm. And so that can put a low level stress on I think that. It, I think it kind of goes both ways a little bit where his wrist will flop the well, other way. Well, that can also put a, if you flop it into rapid flexion too, that mm. puts a maximum stretch on that whole thing. That's probably right? why he's dealing with it. Probably. He has a lot of this. The little flappy looking arm wrist. thing. Yeah, very yeah. W- weak wrist. <laughs> Well, a lot of runners have, and as you're supposed to, have more of a relaxed upper body when you're running. Mm. You shouldn't have a lot of muscular tension in your upper body in his defense. Got it. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was like more of a genetic thing. (laughs) So, (laughs) no, so that's very, or doing lots and lots of gripping, repetitive tasks. A lot of people that get into, that use a lot of um, vibratory, you know, heavy torque like Uh tools happens a lot to them. I had something called, I think when I'm looking it up, when I used to do granite countertops, yeah, and I'd have to fabricate them. Yep, and I think it was called trigger finger. That's different. Okay, different. It my hand was locked yep. like this. That when that I'd is wake up. So that's different. That is actually in a. This is, there's a whole pulley system involved when that's with the gorilla fingers gripping the machine. What you repetitive yeah. squeezing basically? That's a different pathology. Okay. That's completely different. That's involving where your finger kind of locks and you have to kind of physically unlock it. Yeah, it was brutal. That's because um, you have little pulleys, believe it or not, that are kind of tacked down to the. Part of your palm and in the fingers themselves because they keep the tendons close to the bone. Otherwise, they would flay out. Yeah. And when you get, you could get nodules uh, in the tendons, and instead of sliding through the pulleys nicely, they get stuck. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's an inflammatory That's it's, process. That's why it triggers. It would take like an hour for it to it's release. It's bad, man. Itself. Yeah, it can get bad. People sometimes need surgery for that. But yeah, that's a different thing. So back to the lat, what we call lateral epicondylitis. Yeah. Um, yet. Yeah, so the, the biggest thing to do um, with that, self-treatment works great with that thing called pin and stretch, mm-hmm. right? And what you end up doing, um, especially if you feel it getting sore, yeah. you don't want to just power through it. You want to give the signals to the nervous system to relax that muscle in the tendon so we can get more blood flow in there. Mm-hmm. If you guys remember back, we did an episode on mobility and we talked about muscle spindles. Mm-hmm. They're receptors um, through the muscle themselves and something called Golgi tendon organs. They're basically things that are in parallel with the muscle and tendon that sense stretch of the tendon and give feedback to the spinal cord on what's going on there. When you start to overuse something, those things get super sensitive and get into a protective response and they promote the sustained con- protective contraction via mm-hmm. reflex. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you have to interrupt that reflex. And the way to do it is this pin and stretch technique where what you'll end up doing, for instance, for lateral epicondylitis, what I have people do is put their their elbow on like a desk or something. Mm -hmm. And we want to bring, uh, so your elbow is on the desk, your hand is pointed to the ceiling. You, You let your hand fall into extension. In other words, like you're holding a tray, Mm -hmm. okay? And But you don't want to activate the muscle. You just want to let gravity oh, hold okay. it there. All right. And then that's putting that muscle in the most shortened position possible. Mm. Okay? Just then the you, natural. The natural holding. shortened position, right. Okay. But you're not actually forcing into that. You're letting okay. gravity kind of do that. And then you go to that bony prominence. It should be really tender. Mm-hmm. You don't want to put your finger directly on that. You want to go a little bit, like an inch or so towards the <laughs> wrist. Okay, I was, been pushing right on. I was ripping because what on you're that doing thing. is you're putting it on the anchor point. Imagine if I had a rubber band uh, oh, attached yeah. to an anchor point in a wall, and I put a force on it. There's a ton of force at that anchor point, okay. right? That's the anchor point. You don't want to put your finger on the anchor point. Okay. You want to come down a little bit towards the wrist. Mm-hmm. You want to, while it's relaxed and in so short. kind of on the meaty part of it. Yeah, the yeah, on the tendon itself. And you can kind of uh, move your finger back and forth across, and you can kind of feel it almost like a piano wire mm-hmm. when they're really tight. Yeah, using kind of like the literally the tip of the tip of your finger, finger right? Yeah. And then you, you put... Um, 
a pretty good amount of force on that and pin it down. Mm -hmm. And then while it's pinned... So we're not rolling it or anything. No, you're going to pin it. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take your hand and then move it into flexion the opposite way. It doesn't feel good. No, it doesn't. (laughs) So you're pinning it and then you're putting the muscle into stretch while you're pinning it. What this does, it starts inhibiting those muscle spindles. So now we're we're putting our wrist the other way. The other way, like you're flexing it down. Like you're doing an over-the-top type of arm wrestling thing, right? You got to do the finger... Yeah, exactly. Now, at the end of this, when you're down into flexion as far as you can, you're going to release the pressure on the tendon Mm -hmm. with the other hand. Mm -hmm. You're going to bring it back gently into extension without any pinning. Wow, that's right. Okay. And then you're going to pin it again while it's short, and Mm -hmm. you're going to repeat the process and come back down again. And it should feel, when you pin, it should feel It's rough, man. It's rough. Yeah, but just don't do it at the anchor point. After you do like five or six of those reps in that one spot, you'll start moving down mm. the, the forearm towards the wrist more. Okay. And so it should take you about 10 minutes to do that lateral part of your forearm. Okay. okay. What that's going to do is it's going to give a, it's going to inhibit that what we call myotatic reflex, that tension. Mm-hmm. It's going to give you a window of time where, where it reflexively relaxes that whole muscle tendon complex. And then that allows blood flow back in there and oxygenation, and it interrupts that cycle. But if you keep powering through that and don't do anything about it, that can get nasty where you start to have tendon pathology. In other words, the tendon starts to try to repair itself inappropriately, mm-hmm. and you get what some, what something called tendinopathy or tendinosis, whatever you want to call it. It's this chronic thing where the tendon becomes more like beef jerky and it's mm-hmm. not very pliable anymore. Okay. It can become a, I've seen this happen with painters and uh, professions like that and they these guys uh actually have been taken out of their jobs before because they just can't do a lot of laborers will run into these issues yeah and the preventive thing while you're doing it you could take a couple minutes even like just a micro break and just do a couple reps with that and just kind of keep it keep that blood flow in there right so how about the the other side okay the other side is a little more complex the other side the so if we put put your hand back down on the table, palm your palm up. is up. Yeah. Now, now we're going to look at the side of your wrist and forearm that's where your pinky, your little finger is. It's the, called the ulnar side. Is this still pin and stretch? Yep. Okay. But we're going to do some. It's a, but the anatomy is different. It's really important. The anatomy. There's some sensitive anatomy on this side that that is not present on the other side. So as you follow the pinky down the hand, the wrist, into the forearm, you come all the way to the elbow where people know what their funny bone is, right? Can you bump. turn to the side bone just so because you can't really see? Oh, yeah. The yeah, on the other hand, that's good. So what you're putting your finger on right now on that medial side or ulnar side of the elbow is called the funny bone. It's not really called the funny bone. People call it that. A little that. nub coming out there. What that is is the cubital tunnel. It is an actual tunnel of bone where the ulnar nerve passes through. Mm-hmm. Okay, and it's also there's also a connection point there, the bony connection point, where the muscles that make the wrist do the flexion movement, oh, okay. like a wrist curl, mm-hmm. that all attaches there. So, and the there's also a muscle called pronator teres, which attaches there. The one that makes your arm go from palm up to palm down, like if I'm actively forcing my okay. yeah, like that. Yeah. That muscle does that too, okay? That attaches there, and so does the wrist flexors, okay? The problem is when those get inflamed, they can also kind of piss off the ulnar nerve, which is very close proximity there. Mm. And the symptoms of that will be tingling into your little little pinky and also part of your ring finger too. Mm. And so if you have tingling in those, that means your ulnar nerve is irritated, mm. okay? And then you, when you do the pin and stretch, you definitely don't want to get near the ulnar nerve on this. And you know it's like that, that's kind of very sharp electrical type, shocking mm-hmm. type of thing, right? And when, when you find that, you, it'll actually, you'll feel it in that pinky. And yeah, you stay away from that little yeah. bony prominence. You yeah. want to, just like the other one, you don't want to go on the anchor point anyway, right? So we're going to come up towards the wrist about an inch, and you can usually use your thumb on this one yeah. and dig in. So it's going to be the opposite way for pin and stretch on this. Mm. So when I have my uh, hand in flexion, in other words, like I'm doing a wrist curl, mm-hmm. that is going to be my shortened position. Okay. Okay. So you can put your, you can even kind of hold your elbow in your opposite hand, point your wrist at the ceiling, have your hand flop down into flexion like a wrist curl, but relax it. Let gravity hold it there. Okay. Then you're going to p- 
push on that tendon, not on the ulnar nerve, but above it. I think I got it. Yeah, and then you're going to open up your wrist. Would I, if I had the ulnar nerve, would I feel that tingling? Oh, dude, yeah. Okay. You're not gonna you're not gonna press on the ulnar nerve. Okay. Long, you'll okay. know it's there. I just just stay away from that that part. You're gonna open up that wrist to like that waiter's carry position, right? Mm. Then you're gonna release the as thumb. As far as my wrist goes. As far as your wrist goes, then you're gonna release the pressure on that thumb. You're going to fold it back over, let it hang there in deflection, then you're going to pin it again. So it's going to be the same thing. So it's the opposite of the other one because um, just because of the muscular action is, is opposite. So where the shortening is in wrist flexion on this one, that's lengthening on the other side. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the same, same, same protocol. Um, that helps a ton. Okay. Okay, just got to be wary of that ulnar nerve. Now, if someone feels like they have an ulnar nerve issue. So, this is where, if it, so ulnar nerve's really important. So, I'll feel it in that bicep. Well, you will, because the ulnar nerve doesn't stop at the elbow there, but that's just the most common point of irritation. Mm -hmm. All these nerves come all the way up to the neck, and they're part of what's called the brachial plexus, which is just basically a bundle, think of like a wire bundle. Right, it comes out of the neck between C five level and T one, and it comes together and travels through these two neck muscles called the scalenes, under the collarbone, under the pectoralis minor, which is a deep pec muscle, into your armpit, and then through your arm, and it branches off into the individual nerves there. So you're feeling the ulnar nerve continuation up your arm is what you're feeling, and that can happen. It's called retrograde symptoms where you're having. I mean, you see in carpal tunnel all the time where the problem's at the wrist, but they can start, when, when it gets bad, they can start to have it travel up the forearm. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the bottom line on that. Ulnar nerve's really important. You don't want to mess around with it. If you have months and months and it's not getting better, you have numb little finger and ring finger, you can start to lose. Um, the ulnar nerve does a lot with the muscles in the hand too. And you can lose strength in the hand. You may start dropping things. Um, you don't want to mess around with that. You want to go see usually a hand surgeon. They'll get a nerve conduction study to show where it's entrapped because it's also possible it can get entrapped at the wrist. There's something called Guyon's Canal. It's a little canal at the wrist. Um, it can get entrapped at the cubital tunnel too. In other words, you need to have a professional look at that because yeah. you don't want to let that go. Just like carpal tunnel, you don't want to let that go for years because then even if you get it kind of released, it may not come back. Yeah. Okay, so that's an important point on all this stuff. Okay. So it's a very common, it's really important for our sport, too, yeah. to kind of know that. Um, but, but we see a lot of laborers that do jiu-jitsu. Absolutely. Like it just, it's compounding. They're swinging a hammer I, or whatever it is, dude, painting. And I used, When I was a, a, a diver, did underwater construction before I was back in, in medicine, mm -hmm. um, heavy, you know, jackhammers and... Yeah all kinds of just heavy tool use yeah. and uh man even in my when i was in my 20s man i was already starting to get beat up by wow. that man it's okay. no joke yeah um, that's good info yeah and i think a common issue that a lot of people are will benefit from those stretches i mean when i so yeah and so that brings up a point the stretch it, so the pin and stretch is more of a myofascial treatment it's not treating the nerve if you get this diagnosed if you have like ulnar nerve symptoms where you have uh, the pinky and the ring finger numb all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you actually probably should get seen and get it diagnosed because there are some things you can do. A physical therapist can take you something uh, through something called ulnar flossing, nerve flossing, mm -hmm. where you can actually help move that nerve. Mm -hmm. But if it's entrapped Got it. badly, you can actually do more damage you need to, to it. Know. Yeah. You kind of need to know at that okay. point. You need a higher level of care. Okay, if you're not having those some of those ulnar sy symptoms, and you can work on the other stuff there. Then yeah, that now could be good. you can have ulnar symptoms without it being entrapped on this medial side of the elbow, just from the inflammation from those attachment points are mm. so close to the, where the ulnar nerve is. Yeah. You can have like a little carryover inflammation and irritation, that causing some minor like numbness and tingling. Gotcha. Yeah. But it would be kind of go. It would go away, and you know what I mean. It wouldn't yeah. be like this lasting progressive thing. Mm. Okay. So yeah. Um, had another uh, separate question, separate person. Uh -huh. uh, they uh, just started listening not long ago. Oh, cool. They're Welcome. Out of, out of the eastern Washington. Oh, right. Like what, Spokane? Yeah, or? right around there. Oh, cool. Um, and they had a question for their wife, actually. Okay. And uh, I'm just going to kind of read it and 
I'll probably say something weird, but it's okay. Uh, it says my wife is in her early forties and thinking about starting, uh, starting to explore uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Mm-hmm. However, she has factor V laden, factor five Leiden. Leiden, okay. The V is the Roman numeral. Ah, uh, got it for five. It's a good, good test. Yeah, and then uh, she, he says she was uh, always told that she can't take hormones due to the increased clotting danger. He wonders, is this still true? And could you cover it at some point? So I'm going to defer this one to someone who's actually a hormone expert in women's health. It's my wife. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll ask her, but I'll tell you what I will say about this. So typically, if someone has factor V Leiden or prothrombin 2, or a, a lot of these kind of genetic predispositions to clotting, um, you know, classically you're told these women are not supposed to take birth control pills um, and especially smoke at the same time too. I um, mean, it just increases the risk of blood clot formation. I think this is a little bit of an overreach and just an overgeneralization, say they can't be on hormone therapy. I don't know if that is true or not. Um, and I will have to ask Carrie, who goes to conferences probably quarterly. Right international hormone conferences and even if she doesn't know she can reach out to an international expert Mm -hmm. so let me get back to them on that one because that's a great question um and if they're in washington um they can certainly do a telemedicine um kind of an appointment with carrie which i'm sure she'd be happy to yeah we we have referenced before uh on episodes that carrie's been on uh there is uh, like a naturopath website you can go to to see uh, it's like a registry, but like anything, yep. mechanics, photographers, doctors, doctors. there's good and bad, yep. kooky and wacky. Jiu-jitsu and, gyms. Yep. You, uh-huh. you can't necessarily just trust a registry. Yep. So wouldn't say we can recommend someone on that side of the mountains yet. Carrie may know someone. Yes, Carrie might. And... I would actually just reach out Stanwood and Integrated Medicine. Stanwood Integrated Medicine. Um, and to Carrie. Yeah. Yeah. And just say, a uh, matter of fact, I think she had a patient not too long ago that came to her from the podcast. Yeah. Didn't knew about her from that. So, And you can at least get the ball rolling uh, yep. via telemedicine. She's uh, great at that. And then she might, uh, through that, might be able to get the ball going, get you in a right direction Mm -hmm. maybe you're comfortable with telemedicine and and it it can work out with carrie or she can maybe point you to someone that is at least close by that she would trust yes but you are because this specific person is in washington Mm -hmm. she can yeah uh, she yeah carrie has a washington medical license so this is a that's a a really good question and it's it's kind of a special case there and And we'll touch on it again yeah and i'll i'll ask her because i I mean i'm very interested in to see what she has to say about that so moving on interesting switching gears massively okay seminars okay you did one recently we did a few recently Mm -hmm. and we've done them over time uh quite a few Mm -hmm. are they worth it it depends (laughs) (laughs) on what on who it is, mm-hmm. what, you know, you know, some people like, and there's some individual preference too. Mm-hmm. Like we could go to the same seminar that I would, you know, totally like, this is awesome. Right. And you'd be like, eh, yeah. or vice versa. Right. Um, it, I think picking, if you have someone come up, you should be inviting them for a reason. If you're, running an academy or you know you're the one arranging it mm-hmm. is there something they're doing that you think is going to really um a really different approach another look at something that's going to add to your students knowledge so maybe you have your bread and butter that you teach you have your curriculum you have all this but maybe there's someone out there that's you can get that does just looks through a different For, yeah let for instance, let's just say, you know, this doesn't apply to our academy necessarily at all, but let's just say you have an academy where your head instructor is like 220 pounds, mm-hmm. um, has a very, you know, top heavy kind sure. of pressure big style, man, big man, kind of yeah, and then you maybe invite um, the, you know, like a flyweight world champion up. Yeah. 
there's like highly technical mm-hmm. a plays a different, completely different game mm-hmm. um, that some people in your academy really might like. Yeah. I don't know. You know what I mean? Something yeah. that can add to um, uh, knowledge yeah, um, in a meaningful way. And it's just like anything else. It's like, well, what, you know, what movie am I going to watch? Well, I don't know. What, what do we all like? Do yeah. we like sci-fi? Sure. Or, you know, it doesn't mean they're bad. Yeah. And I think there can be bad seminars. For right? sure. And I think if you are considering a seminar, look up. If you Just do some research. Mm-hmm. You might not find anything. But look up and try to find uh, people uh, reviewing or talking about their experience. Yes. Because it, there is a couple old school, very popular, original jiu-jitsu guys that were in mma and stuff like that that it's notorious that if you go to their seminar 15 years ago Mm -hmm. or last year it's literally the same thing and it's like a stand-up comedian going over their same set just over 20 years and by the way bill a world-class competitor does not mean they're a world-class instructor absolutely right absolutely so if you can do a little research and find like, ah, yeah, I, I did the last two and they were the same thing and they didn't roll after it. I'm not saying that they have to roll after it because if they're paying their bills through competition, uh, I don't know if I would roll a bunch of psycho purple belts and black belts <laughs> that want to <laughs> prove a point. You know? Right. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily think it's it's all that bad if they, if they don't. It's awesome when they do, but uh, I, I do understand. Or if they're older or something like that. So try to find a little info on how other people have liked it. Also, take note if they are from uh, the same association mm. because they might get their head chopped off if they ever said something negative, if they're one part of one of the bigger associations. Oh, I gotcha. And they have a, a top leader in that group. And mm. if they said, you know, this guy, Buchecha, you know, it's a checkmate thing. Buchecha did a crappy seminar. Like, that guy's going to get killed. Right. right, right. Not saying Buchecha does bad seminars. Actually, I've heard the opposite that he does actually really good seminars. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andrew's done him. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and he rolled with people and stuff like that. Which That's is awesome. Awesome. That's being one of the best ever. But um, also, it's as good. Let's say it's great. They showed perfect stuff for your game. Mm-hmm. All that. It's only as good as you make it. Yeah. So take notes if they allow recording. Come back to the stuff because let's say it's three hours long. You're only going to be, I mean, think of a normal class that's only an hour. You barely retain anything from that. Mm-hmm. You, if you want to truly get something from it, have some sort of organization mm-hmm. that you'll be able to come back to it and not just rely on your 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 mind. For sure. Like, you know, showing a bunch of like kind of seemingly random techniques where the seminars that we've had, we I, we had a really good one from a coral belt we were fortunate enough to have up here that was more positionally based and that we're showing a position and working stuff off of that and that seems to stick better you know like here's well, he different. also did something interesting that i'd never seen what's that at the end the last quarter he said what do you guys want i love that to let's like, break down a problem so people raise their hand i'm struggling with neon belly uh huh and getting out or whatever it was. I love that. And he had him and one of his uh, prize pupils. Yep. And uh, they went over how Hercules would do it, how At- Ataich would do it, mm-hmm. and it was like, it was awesome. Yeah. I, I'd never seen actually that. Uh, that structure. was real. That was really cool. I, I really dig that. You know, kind of like, can you help me fix something I'm having problems yeah, with? In front of everybody. I love it. Um, because some people aren't comfortable with that because mm-hmm. they have a curriculum they want to go over. Yeah. And that just shows you the, the breadth and the knowledge of a, of a yeah. eighth degree. <laughs> coral well, yeah, belt, it, you know? it was cool. Cause you had, yeah, an eighth degree coral belt, coral yeah. belt yeah. but then you also had a 2022 master one world champ. Yeah. <laughs> right. To if there, cause I think I asked something that was, Hercules just pushed it to at the H because he's like, you know, this is more of a game that you're going to run into. Mm. Maybe due to size, mm. modern uh, points, whatever. Yeah. So it was like, 
it, it's like one of those things I have a joke where I say between uh, me and Andrew, mm. we know everything. And then when they ask me a question, and I just go, well, that's what Andrew knows. <laughs> but he's not there to answer it. Of course. So. <laughs> that's actually pretty funny. The, uh, that's funny. But it's kind of that thing where they there's so much knowledge within there, that, that little group that yeah. they could kind of answer. Yeah, we, we had one a couple of years ago with uh, Cole. Cole Franson. Franson, yeah. Yeah, which I thought was it was completely different and super cool, too. Mm-hmm. Right? A completely different approach. Yeah, and I did a J-Flow seminar, mm-hmm. Justin Flores, mm-hmm. uh, that w- which was fantastic. He and he didn't necessarily show a move. Mm-hmm. He showed drilling techniques to develop certain moves. Yeah, I like it. Which was, and then how they chain, and ultimately at the end, they all, all the drills worked into one drill, like you, if you wanted. Mm. Um I like that. that. That was fantastic. We just did an AOJ seminar, which was super cool. Well, that's awesome. Right? AOJ passing. So doing a little research, it can be it can be completely a waste of money. Mm-hmm. Try to vet out a little bit what people that have done their seminars previously. So you're answering, you had a question and you just, you already had your answer. Well, I'm the captain now. Okay. <laughs> I was just, just wanted to be. Just, well, I wanted your opinion too, sucker. Well, like. I gave it, and you were yeah, like, it was overruled. Too, it was too long, though. <laughs> Liv, do you got any, any uh, s- two cents on on that? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about this? Mm. I got another one for you. Uh-oh. Why do people in the jiu-jitsu community hate calling academies dojos, and they we, they typically do not call the instructor or a professor, uh, sensei. Mm-hmm. But we will drop a hot dime on that Ashigarami verbiage or Juju Katami or j- yes, Juji, Juji Katami, Kesa Katami, Kesa Katami, Sumageshi. I'll tell you why. Why do we, why do we do I'll this? tell you why. Why are we the way that we are? <laughs> One, is just a naming convention as far as what do you want to call your instructor or academy? Just a preference thing. You okay. do want to be traditional Japanese. Uh-huh. The other one is a way to actually know what we're talking about. Oh. Okay, just like Eddie Bravo did with his 10th planet system. Uh-huh. He named some, uh, you know, positions or, you know, techniques. Mm-hmm. So you're not like having to describe the thing. Like mm-hmm. if you say, Hey, get into Ashi, you know, Ashi Garam, you know what I mean? Yeah. They had move, they had names for intermediary positions as well as full positions. Then people will know what we're talking about. Yeah. It's more of a communication piece. So I think those are, those can be looked at differently. The other one's kind of a preference where how formal and how traditional you want to be with that. You could come up, instead of using the Japanese names for the movie, you could come, do what Eddie Bravo did. As long as, the problem with that is, unless you're in like a 10th planet system, you're like, I, don't, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? Yeah, because you can do New York zombie to mission control <laughs> into right crackhead. That's what I'm saying. And so, unless you're in that system, you don't know what you're talking about. But if you have a stand, the the Japanese is fairly standardized, yeah. where it is more broadly accepted. Mm. Not that many people know it. Um, if you if you watch any of John Danaher's, yeah, enough, you'll pick up a lot of it. Wait, I always wondered that it's a communication thing. Some people are called sensei, though. Okay, when do you become a sensei? Teacher. Is that what that means? Yeah. Sure. I mean, that's like, when can you be called a teacher? Didn't Mai call you sensei? Mai calls me sensei. Oh, God. <laughs> just for you. <laughs> so just just because it's you, uh-huh. you I'm never going to call you that. Because <laughs> um, uh. then I think it'd be... it'd be. She says sensei Bilsan. Well, where's Mai from? I believe the island of... Japan. That's right. Her name is Maiko, actually. I know. And so you didn't know that. I, oh my God. Yes, I do. <laughs> actually. So do you so that is very appropriate. Mm-hmm. She's using very traditional, like you in this is that in this cultural appropriation. No, it's not, because she that's her culture. No, okay. for us to use it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was asking for her to use it, but no. Why that's her language. <laughs> So if if you're in that setting and you are acting in that role, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. The problem is I am sensei. At that point, 
right in now. the strict <laughs> no no you're not in the strict definition in your class running that is your class you're running mm-hmm. by the definition of what sensei is the problem is people made it culty do i have to run it by andrew if i'm gonna tell everyone to call me sensei in the day class i dare you because i'm that's just gonna give us so much material to make fun of you <laughs> Please do. See, I thought people didn't Please. like the term dojo or sensei because of Karate Kid. I, I mean, that was my guess. But again, it's still Japanese, right? It's the culture. It doesn't matter what the art was. Those are Japanese arts and jujitsu and judo. Is right? academy more of a Brazilian thing? Yes. Mm. So is professor. Right, right. Yeah. Because they go together, right? It, it's still what is a professor? It's a teacher, and right? An academy is a place it where you a go, gym. right? Because <laughs> we're savages, yeah. right? Instructor, instructor, right? So there is a formality. There's a formality there, but with you, if you make everyone call you sensei, it's gonna because uh-huh. I know you and who you are as a person. Watch it. It's gonna sound pretentious, mm. and we're gonna make fun of you. Mm. Okay. Not that by the strict definition, it isn't true. Yeah. So I know a lot of people will call like Shanji and Salo Habero sensei. Mm-hmm. Okay. I just don't, I was, wasn't sure. And then like a lot of people call Hercules master. Yeah. Uh, master Hercules. And I was like, when do you, when do you become a master? I when thought, do you become a sensei? You know, someone can correct me on this with the master thing. I thought it was at Coral Belt. I could be I wrong. I did a little research and did you? I, yeah, the red and black belt is. Mm-hmm. Um, That's what I thought. Is typically, I think, when people will call you master. That's what I thought. That was um, my impression too. But again, you know, it's it's a it's a method of showing respect, basically. Mm-hmm. Whether you call someone professor, teacher, sen- you know, yeah. sensei, um, it's just you know, <laughs> it depends on. <laughs> At this point, I ain't calling you sensei. I don't care if I go to your class. <laughs> Because I'm, you know, I'm You're never allowed in my class. I, <laughs> that's fine. How about that? It's one of those things that Charlie Chaplin says, I would never want to be a member of a club that wants me to be a member. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, it does. I, I'd never want to. If someone is inviting, yeah, if someone is allowing me and wants me to be a member of their club, it's not for me. You live by that? No, I'm just saying that's <laughs> what, in this, ca- in this case, I would. Charlie Chaplin was a dork. Yeah, about that <laughs> perhaps. Um, okay, I just want to, you know, run by. Let's but I, I think they're different things. I think they're used for different reasons. You can yeah. still sound super pretentious talking <laughs> using all the. I know you guys brought it up last time. Yeah, you said, "Oh, he's trying to flex his Japanese knowledge." I'm trying to use every little bit of leverage I have on you. I know. Okay, it has nothing to do with as anything. you wither away in front of that. That's, you know, <laughs> it's my. It's like a guy drowning, trying to like throw throw some shit at you. You know what I'm saying? I will get you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm gonna move on. Okay. And why don't you whip open that that bad boy? All right. Because we're gonna talk and preview. Oh, I gotta put on my glasses. A big event, nerd alert. So we got a huge event coming up. Who's number one? Who's number one? Gordon Ryan. Versus Saturday, February 25th. Felipe Peña, Parquisa. This is their fourth match mm-hmm. together over a like six year period. Um, oh, they're having another match. Yes. Oh, yeah. Is that what all that uh, mm-hmm. video was? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Him driving that Corolla. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that, Chris? What? He uh, <laughs> oh, I saw it. to drive a Corolla instead of a fancy car, and he says that's. His Have you looked at that Corolla? That's a nice ass Corolla. It's like a brand new one. It's, it's beautiful. They're not that bad. No, <laughs> that's not slumming it, and that's fine. He yeah. can do what he wants. Yeah, He's, he should see my 1985 Subaru Loyal wagon that i used to drive that's what my point is you know it's like you know it wasn't a pinto yeah. right i had to jump start that bitch like i, I always made sure i backed up onto Dude, a hill I, and then i had a weightlifting bar i know and i had to hit the starter this is when i met bill i <laughs> i had a Datsun that b210 yeah yeah dude i had a 70s chevy nova all are questionable whether they were going to start <laughs> yeah okay so that's why I thought it was kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. It's it's tongue in cheek, man. Yeah. I was, it's like yeah. I think he's genuinely feeling like he is like making life quote unquote harder for the training. Like he genuinely thinks he is, 
but it's so relative. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it depends on what your other cars are, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, and he's got some nice cars. So. He does. Yeah. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, but then um, also, I think Felipe is kind of doing the same thing. He said like he's living in a little apartment and okay. all that. So I like it. They're both just torturing themselves. I, I like it. With Corollas. <laughs> with Corollas. Um, but yeah, this is coming this weekend. Yeah. It's going to be a big one. Uh, not just that main event, which I'm interested in, but... I don't have as much interest as I kind of wish I did, but uh, there's some other matches that are uh, really good. I, by the way, uh, someone that's on the card, um, Giancarlo, there's that cool documentary on Flow. Did you guys watch it? I have not yet. Becoming Dangerous. Yeah, it's like an hour long. It's very well done. There's actually a cameo of a couple of people in there. Yeah, I know. There's old Nikita, the I, Russian bot. I was looking on the ADCC footage. I was actually looking. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. Josh, uh, yep. Andrew, Glenn. Yeah, but uh, so let's start from the bottom. We're gonna do just the main card, okay? I don't really know too much about the. Is the uh, Gordon Ryan one? Is that gonna be unlimited or? or yeah, no time, no, no time, time limit. Yes. Yep, no, no time limit. Fun. So it's at least forty-five minutes. Oh dear. Um, just for that match alone, we'll see. Hopefully, it doesn't go till one in the morning. Well, for the East Coast, <laughs> it definitely will. Yeah, unfortunately, gonna yeah, because so it's starting 10 p.m. The main card starts at 10 p.m. Eastern time, yes. so that's seven for us here on the West Coast. Thank yeah. goodness. And um, a, yeah, actually, and let's just all have a moment of silence and prayer for flow grappling. Keep the card rolling. Match ends. Throw your little B-roll highlight of the next competitor, the second competitor. And then get the match going. Don't put up that little F with the music and let us wait 15 minutes because the first match was fast and now you got to fill time. And then you we got 15 minutes, 20 minutes in between each freaking match. We've talked about match. this. Get that bitch rolling because that might be a three hour match. Yep. The, the final one. Mm -hmm. Like, stop it. Just go. Like, uh, Spider Invitational was fantastic a week mm -hmm. ago. Mm hmm. It was rolling. I okay. Just, let's start with the first match on the main. Renee card. Souza and Kieran Kichuk. Yes. Renee Souza, Kieran Kichuk. Dude, what do you know about these guys? I don't know a lot about Kieran. You know about Renee? Yeah. What do you know about him? Well, I've seen him compete. Yeah. So he is a, a tricky fella, brown belt, mm -hmm. which in Nogi is like, yeah. doesn't even mean much, uh, out of 10th Planet, mm -hmm. a buggy choke aficionado. Right. Uh, famous for Buggy Choke and Jay Rodriguez to get on the Who's Next TV show. Uh, I think this is a very tall order. Kieran Kachuk is an absolute murderer. False reap, probably the best false reap uh, practitioner. Nice. Um, in jiu-jitsu. Um, That's why I rely on you for this. Because yeah. you're like <laughs> our resident nerd right. here. I don't, yeah. So... Um, lethal leg locks i mean tenacious mm. when he's going after him he's he's going after that's him. gonna be a problem then big time mm -hmm. now curveball he's about 155 ish mm -hmm. pounds yeah um renee is about 185 okay um so he's gonna have a, a pretty sizable size advantage uh renee souza over kieran um but yeah you remember you remember though Back in uh, uh, previous ADCC, where we had the um, uh, holy cow, why am I blanking on his name? Absolutes, um, Lachlan Giles. Yes, yeah. So you, yeah, you know what can happen there. Yeah. Now Renee's <clears throat> more of a leg lock. He's pr more proficient in leg locks than I think all of those giants that mm -hmm. Lachlan sure, played. Sure, sure. But uh, it, that's it's something to mention for sure. Yeah. I think Renee's a little out of his league on this one. Okay. Um, not to be shitty, but I think Kieran takes this um, in regulation. With, okay. With some sort of inside heel hook. That would be my prediction. It's. Mm. I think they put it as the first match because it's going to be good. Okay. It's good. They, they both, uh, Renee has a lot of little tricky stuff besides the buggy choke. Yeah, he's just very crafty. And then Kieran is just tenacious on the attacks. Well, I will then feed you these, and I'm going to let you go. Okay. Okay, just like you do with my... It, well, unless if... Can let, no, of course. One. If I have something I want to add, yeah. I will. But um, So, uh, Jasmine Rocha 
and Amanda Bruce. Mm-hmm. So here we have uh, Wagner Hoka's daughter. I was going to ask. Yeah. That is a relation. Yeah. And just imagine Wagner Hoka's daughter and you will imagine her because she's aggressive. Excellent. She's, uh, she made it to the finals against, uh, was it Tammy Musumeci? Um, this last Nogi Worlds mm. and um, took it all the way, I believe, to decision, um, if I remember right. It was a very close match. So she is uh, top of the food chain already. Amanda Bruce, don't know a ton about her. Um, I know she had a couple notable wins recently, um, but I, I also know she has a kind of a firecracker style. Mm. So this match I would look at as being one of the more entertaining matches on the whole card. Oh, like, cool. Because they're both uh, just hard nose, aggressive. Uh, and it just, I don't know, a lot of time it seems like the ladies' matches are always just a little, they can be more um, fun to watch. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that. I kind of put it out there a little bit more. Yeah, I, I like it. Uh, That's so, so I'm actually going to take uh, Hoka on this one. Okay. Yeah. And... Next is Oliver Taza and uh, Jonatas Gracie. Mm, yes. So not a true Gracie by blood. Jonatas Gracie. Jonatas is. But uh, um, I don't remember how he. I know he's not a true blooded Gracie, but mm. I think he like married in or not. He didn't marry in, but like a family member did or something. Um, but anyways, uh, known as having some of the like best grips, one of the strongest uh, people in his division. Um, incredible base, just one Nogi Worlds. Um, mm. He did have a hurt knee by the end of the match, uh, so that'll be interesting to see. Uh, he's done well against Taza in the past mm. in IBJJF. I, this yeah. is not IBJJF. No, it's not. And we know Oliver Taza as being a very aggressive. He has a go-to sequence, yep. and he, he, he gets after it. He's aggressive at getting there. So this will be really interesting to see if Oliver can off balance. He has a good camp too. Yeah. So <laughs> Taza splits time between TriStar and New Wave. New Wave, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, that's yeah. The game plan is going to be there exactly um, from from both places. Yeah, really. You got, you got Farasa Hobby and you got Autos. Danaher. Yeah, you know. and then but, but I mean, Jonathan is from Autos. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's gonna be good. Yeah, it's a nice little rivalry we have. Mm. Rivalry from the Autos New Wave kind of. Deal. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, I'm actually gonna take Jonathan on this. Hmm. I, Interesting. I, I think Taza is actually favored, um, and I get why because he's a leg lock specialist. Mm-hmm. It's free reign; anything goes. No points, you know, necessary. Um, but uh, Jonathan is. Um, I think one of the ways that you see Taza lose is when someone has tremendous foundation. They're, they don't have openings. You can do a bunch of tricky stuff, but they are it's like a JT Torres kind of thing. Yeah. It's hard to catch them slipping. Mm-hmm. And Jonathan, I think, is like that. Is a I think he's the underdog, but I'm I'm gonna go with him to win. Okay. I'm I'm looking forward to it. You're talking yeah. them up. Great. Um, now we have, speaking of, JT Torres Oof. and Majid Hage. 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 Majid Hage. Gorilla hands. Yeah. As as he is known because he's a baseball bat choke uh, oh. uh, connoisseur. Um, he's also got just huge hands. So uh, this is going to be a good one for mm-hmm. sure because it's a huge clash of styles. Mm-hmm. I cannot pick against JT. No, man. I just, it's hard for me too as well. And so a little background uh, Majid Hage, he went through both South American trials, so both trial mm-hmm. ADCC trials in Brazil and America. Made it to the finals on almost all of them <laughs> by submitting everyone, but he never won the whole thing. Mm. Um, so that's how he really kind of came about as like being a nogi guy that like he, he was putting a lot of time in with the Rotolos and stuff like that. And uh, very dynamic style. Very fun style, wears a t-shirt and board shorts. Looks like he's just coming off the, the boardwalk cool. in Venice. I'm digging it. Um, but very crafty. Very kind of unorthodox. Not crazy unorthodox. Like let's say some people might say like a Ben Eddy or mm-hmm. something like Ten Planet guy. Uh, but very flowy. Kind of like a Jeff Glover more so. Um, entertaining matches. Submission Hunter for sure. He hates winning by decision. I love it. 
Yeah, this is great. JT Torres, though. He's that guy. Two-time ADCC Dude, champ. Yeah. Uh, he's one of my favorites for a while. Yep. He's been... He's been a little quiet outside of ADCC. Mm -hmm. uh, he's done a few opens where he just completely murders everybody. Mm -hmm. um, at this last ADCC, he, uh, I, I've heard some podcasts talk about this. That, hmm, is JT slipping? Is he going, like, a, losing a step? And they cited at this last ADCC, he lost to a guy that didn't even get on the podium. Now, I think that's uh, a little disingenuous mm -hmm. is one way to say it or uh i think there's context in there that needs to happen the guy he lost to is pj bart right and pj bart was having an amazing tournament yep okay um and pj bart lost to Cade rotolo in a back and forth match that if he didn't get submitted towards the end of the match pj might have won right so it wasn't like oh he lost to a guy that didn't even make it on the podium exactly like PJ was putting it on every single person he went against. Yeah, that's nonsense. Yeah, so I, I don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think, uh, and he had a tough first round, JT did, against uh, 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 the B-team Japanese guy, Katan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, forgot his name, I'm sorry. Ken Wanda, maybe. Um, but I, I just, I, I don't think... Uh, that's a, a sign that JT Torres is losing a step. I, I think he's gonna he's gonna come out here and be a classic JT, and it's it's gonna be like a slow murder. But Majid's gonna make it entertaining. I think the 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 card that they built here has a lot of entertainment value to it. Even though some guys like JT isn't the most entertaining from a flying around Hanato Kanuto Gary Tonin perspective, mm -hmm. but. It's it's like watching uh, Marcelo Garcia. You're, you're seeing a tactician Dude, or absolutely. a Hodge Gracie. Yep. Some or Lucas Lapri. You have to be able like you have to appreciate guys that can mm -hmm. can uh, can do kind of like I don't want to say real jujitsu, but a style of jujitsu that um, tricks don't necessarily work on, mm -hmm. right? It's like I'm gonna do something to you, and you're not gonna be able to stop it. Yeah, it's too. gonna be very like you're. Yeah, your little these little crafty things on Instagram are not going to stop it, right? Um, so I think that's going to be an awesome yeah. one. I'm going with Jetitores. Yeah, me too. Co-main light heavyweight title bout: Pedro Mourinho mm -hmm. and Giancarlo Badoni. I mean, I, holy smokes! I it's it's awesome, yeah. right? But yeah, um, give me give me your two cents. I know two, you know these guys. Yeah, I do. Um. Giancarlo is on a tear. Yeah. And I his momentum, I just think his confidence is way up. He's looking triple C thick, too. Dude, he is. And he's been given, <laughs> Gordon saying that he's given him hell in the gym. So I'm, you know, and I, I not to throw shade on Pedro. I mean, right. The guy's phenomenal. He's um, an effort. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going for Giancarlo on this one. Okay. So Pedro Mourinho, he's the current, I believe, 205 yep, champ. The light heavyweight, yep. <clears throat> and uh, has the title for who's number one. He is a uh, Nogi world champion, absolute, and division. Mm -hmm. He uh, beat Cyborg uh, recently to, to get that absolute title. He is a guillotine specialist. One, he's one of the most aggressive stand-up jiu-jitsu guys there are. Yep. Uh, he's not afraid to push the pace, gas out, or anything. The man will just go. I love it, right? He'll be chippy. All that you'll love to hate him because he'll do a bunch of like kind yep. of cheeky stuff that or cagey stuff. Sure, but you'll like you'll you'll love it, but then you hate it. Um, if you shoot on him, he's gonna grab your neck, and he's gonna try to take it home. Um, super fun to watch, especially if the person he's going against has any sort of energy like that. A.K. Rotolos. That was one of the best matches. Uh, I was just seen. about to say that was fantastic. <clears throat> um, and Bodoni is going to bring out uh, a tactful uh, style mm -hmm. that um, obviously he's got game plan with Danaher being in his corner. I mean, do you remember the? I mean, the foot sweep he hit. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, just like that kind of body lock, kind of. Yes, but it'll be very interesting to see. I mean, if Bodoni can get Mourinho down and hold him there. Mm -hmm. 
that's going to be a challenge because sure. Mourinho is like an alligator. That yeah. the guy will just scramble like crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the hand fighting will start slow from the stand up position, but it's going to get more cagey. Um, and then uh, once they get to the ground, it'll be very interesting to see. But I think Bodoni takes his back and chokes him. Mm. That's your call. Final answer. I man, I can't argue with that. Yeah, but it's not going to be without any fanfare. I think there's going to be some. I think Mourinho probably uh, maybe gets in the standing position, gets like a rides his hips and like mm-hmm. Matt returns him mm-hmm. or something dynamic will happen. Um, it, it'll be it'll be a really good one to watch. Now, main event. Ugh. So we all know who it is. No time limit. Heavyweight bout. Heavyweight title bout. Gordon and Felipe are. You know, doing this one again. Yeah, Gordino. Yes. Um, I mean, I I love Felipe Pena's game. Mm-hmm. I've always liked him. I just, I don't think he can surmount Gordon. I don't think he can. Do you think it goes differently? As a refresher, to, what happened oh, 45 remember, minutes in? Right. So, yeah, yeah, I for sure do think it goes Verbal differently. Tap for, yeah, there's some other things, some yeah. other things going on during that day, as we all know. Yeah some extenuating circumstances. Um, but I really think it depends on what Gordon wants to do. I think it's at that level where I mm-hmm. think he's going to kind of decide how he wants this match to go. Right. So the stuff you're talking about that happened last time, the morning of yep. the match, uh, one of Felipe's very good friends, Leander Lowe, which very popular killed, jiu-jitsu yeah. player, was murdered right. in a crazy way. And uh, he was going to pull out. He didn't. He was, There's some back and forth. He feels men- He felt mentally compromised. Yep. Whether it's an excuse or not, it's neither here or there. We're just putting it out there. Um, I th- And then about 45 minutes in, uh, Felipe almost stopped the match. It was kind of this weird. awkward moment. He went up to hell. A couple minutes later, yeah. uh, he did verbally. Uh, stop. He looked very fatigued, and if you ask Gordon, it's because he ramped up, and that's why. Uh, maybe a combo sure. of, of the things um, where that fatigue, as we all know, when we do get tired, oh my God. we become weaker mentally, and with <laughs> that stuff weighing on him, oh my. it was too much maybe. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I'm, I think that's a good call on that. Um, I just think Gordon is still yeah. on such a level, though. It's. I think we have seen a little bit. Of a chink with uh, in the armor with what Nikki Rod was able to do uh, somewhat recently, and honestly, with the last match with Felipe and Gordon, I think we actually saw a little chink as well. Yeah, I mean, it was it looked good. the first part of that. I mean, the I agree. First twenty minutes, and I'm not going to say. I just think, yeah, first twenty minutes, but yeah. I, yeah, I still don't. It'd take a heck of a lot to put Gordon away. So that's the thing. It is so the chink I was talking about with Felipe is he was able to force 50 mm-hmm. 50 every time Gordon came close to passing, um, or he did pass and then uh, a regard happened. Felipe was extremely good at putting him in 50 50. Mm-hmm. Now, you would think that would be suicide to go into 50 50 with Gordon Ryan because he's a leg lock mm-hmm. expert, but no, nothing ever came of it. And I think it's because the two times that Felipe beat Gordon was through a similar kind of back take off of a leg entry, mm. an outside pressuring leg entry, and it would essentially like a 50-50 kind of thing. And so I think Gordon is a little trigger shy on on trying to, to uh, be aggressive through the 50-50 because Felipe is so good at it. Now, mm. saying that, Gordon... And John Danaher are masterminds when it comes to strategy. Mm -hmm. And Felipe, I don't think, even though he went and joined Autos, and he's got crazy training partners, Kain and Duarte, Mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff for the last month. How good can you? How much better can you get in a month? I know he brought Gordon Ryan, or excuse me, he brought Craig Jones in um, for a couple days. A a lot of people were speculating it was because of. like, you know, cleaning up leg lock stuff? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think Craig has probably more mat time with Gordon than anybody and also knows the body lock system as well as anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think 
that's how Gordon would essentially try passing mm-hmm. is through either the body lock mm-hmm. or um, the uh, kind of like float leg pummeling kind totally. of passing. Yep. And because uh, Nikki Rod passed Felipe yeah, exactly. with the body lock. Right. So you bring Craig in to be like, what is he going to do? How do we defend it? Right. Right. I think that's why they brought Lachlan Giles in for a day. Mm-hmm. But once again, they haven't had much time from that third match to this match. No, it hasn't. I don't know if that's enough time to actually get truly better. That's what I was going to say. I mean, you look at, I mean, they, they've made the point of uh, Giancarlo's kind of just yeah. rapid improvement, like a 10-month period. Yeah. And so I think that's a little more Yeah, super doable. intentional. And he's he switched for... For those 10 months, he switched from his normal training place. He moved. Right. And then he was training twice a day under John Danaher, right. seven days a week. Right. That's a lot of mad time. And John Danaher has, what, 10 guys he's looking after strategically? At Autos, that's, mm. it's different, yeah. right? Um, I'm with you, though. I think it's up to Gordon. Yep. If he wants to prove a point, not just, okay, I'm going to get him tired and, and then I'm going to wait for the openings at that point and then ramp up, which I understand why he does that. But if he's like, no, I'm going to try to finish him under 45 minutes, mm-hmm. I think that'll be, that'll be really interesting mm-hmm. to, to see. But I think Felipe is good enough. If under 30, 40 minutes, he'll have enough gas to take advantage of a Gordon mistake. And I think there is a possibility that Felipe can win. But dang, Dude, Gordon is... Uh, that's a tall order, man. That's a motivated Gordon, too, because he... It is. <clears throat> he wants to even the score. He hates that Craig went there. He hates that he's with Autos. Like, you know, there's all these motivating factors. Yeah. So, um, I'm picking Gordon yep. as well. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you for... And the big reason is because I don't see how Felipe submits Gordon. That was my point, is to finish him. He I gets don't... his back... That's best case scenario because that's the two times it happened yeah, five years ago. That, that's five years ago. But his Gordon's defense, it's I know you can point to Nicky Rod having his back in overtime, but once again he started there. And number two, the time thing and all that. So taking Gordon, yep, putting it on. Olivia, you got anything on uh, any of those? Nope. Were you playing bingo? <laughs> She's playing bingo. No, I wasn't playing bingo. There's something else. Something else going on over there. um yes so that's our picks check it out watch it this weekend on flow grappling and it well this will be aired afterwards we're gonna clip this and we're gonna clip it before this little section we'll clip and put it out there early okay so people can try to get a breakdown and know what they're looking at yeah so that's a good idea otherwise we're like ooh. (laughs) yeah i I think we do that for another one yeah a little weird Um, cool Okay, that sounds like a plan. If you guys can, like, comment, share it, all the episodes. And I'll get back uh, with that question. I'll ask Carrie. So we'll see what she has to say about that uh, that other question. So we'll get back to it. Yeah, if you guys have any other questions, just go ahead and throw them in uh, either grapplingwithpodcast at Gmail or just uh, throw it on YouTube. That's easy. Yep. I like it. Or if you see our personal instagram apmedia.photos don't do it to me you can dm me i never he hasn't it. logged in in three years no <laughs> olivia's private <laughs> that's true i say y'all peace <laughs>